So first, thank you very much thank you. to give your time because you are an incredible woman. You have so much to do and you have always time for everybody and it's great. So we wanted to, know, to speak a little bit about um, uh, geoengineering with you. It's something which embraces all food and water and what is happening, happening now in the world in, uh, in a situation of climate change, of great changement and uh, risks of collapse on every level. I saw the interview you had with Amy uh, Goodman. So first, um, what is for you uh, in this moment the, the, the role of uh, geoengineering? The Not role of geoengineering should, in a world of responsibility, in a world of scientifically enlightened decision making and ecological understanding, uh, it should be zero. There is no role for mm -hmm. geoengineering. Because what is geoengineering but extending the engineering paradigm that has been engineering parts of the earth and aspects of ecosystems and organisms like through genetic engineering. Um, the massive dam building, rerouting of rivers, these were all elements of geoengineering yes. at the level of particular places. Yes. And we have recognized two things. One, that when you don't take into account the way eco ecological systems work, yes. then you do damage. Everyone knows that in effect climate change is a result of that engineering paradigm. We thought we could replace people with fossil fuels, have higher and higher levels of industrialization, of agriculture, of production, without thinking of the greenhouse gases we were emitting. And climate change is really the pollution of the engineering paradigm where fossil fuels drove the industrialism. To now offer that same mindset as a solution is to not take seriously what Einstein said, that you can't solve the problems by using the same mindset that caused them. So the idea of engineering is an idea of mastery. And today, the role that we are being asked to play is a role based on informed humanity. In my eyes, geoengineering started in the 50s with atomic tests because in this period they started to geoengineering to make a geoengineering of atmosphere of, of earth in a in a global sense in a bigger sense and a lot of projects in the 50s started to organize the earth the planet in a new way in a new um, with a new idea of engineering really the whole planet so with the power of the atomic bomb scientists made a shifting in their mind in my eyes so in this period in the 50 started also very um, uh, energetically the weather modification it's part of geoengineering and we have here the map of etc group mm -hmm. in the whole world they are doing it yeah. And uh, you cannot do locally modifications without changing the whole system. So I know in India and in Thailand, <coughs> Thailand and Australia, weather modification maybe is more discussed, more open than in, in Europe. For example, in Italy they made weather modification in the 80s, but people doesn't know, doesn't know it. What do you think about the role of weather modification in sense of geoengineering yeah. for food, for water, for the whole system? Well, weather modification is a very small part of geoengineering. Geoengineering right now is the hubris of saying, oh, there's climate change and we're living in the Anthropocene age and now human beings will be the shapers of a future by totally controlling the overall functions of not just our planet, but our relationship with other planets. So many of the solutions offered have been putting reflectors in the sky to send the sun back as if the sun was a problem rather than the very basis of life. Or to put pollutants into the atmosphere in order to create uh, 
a layer of pollution that would stop the sun from shining. But the instability of the climate that is the result of the greenhouse effect will just be aggravated by these interventions. Now, whether modification done in a narrow-minded way to say, oh, we are not getting rain, so let us precipitate rain artificially so that our agriculture doesn't fall, fail, is something, for example, the Chinese did for the Olympics. They made sure there would be no rain in Beijing during the period of the Olympics. It is a lower level of hubris than the larger projects of geoengineering. Well, you know this map? Yes, of course right. I know, etc. Yeah. And you see that it's not all, uh, it is a group uh, published also a part, it's only a part because every day something else is coming out. Uh, in the whole world, yeah. they are doing it. So if you yeah. made in a lot of points, yeah, but it's not so much the points. What does it mean for weather extremes, for example? The first thing is it creates more instability. Oh, the yes. second, and, and we are dealing with instability, and therefore we must deal more with actions that create insurance <clears throat> against instability rather than aggravating the instability. It's like I'm driving a car, and I know there's a precipice there. I should put the car in reverse and then turn into another direction. What geoengineering is doing is saying, let's put our foot on the accelerator. And the precipice is climate instability, climate unpredictability. And at the root of it is the false idea that these silly little actions will be able to control and regulate the weather and the climate. But the second most important part of why geoengineering is so, so wrong is that it is the ultimate expression of patriarchal irresponsibility. Patriarchy is based on appropriating rights and leaving responsibility to others. In this case, the scientists who are playing these games, the investors who are financing it, are all doing it without having any consent for these experiments, any approval for these experiments, locally or globally, and worse, without thinking of the consequences of what it can lead to and without ever, ever being bound to responsibility. Therefore, it is the ultimate expression of all the destructive tendencies yeah, it, of patriarchy. And you see, it, it, you can take yeah. one name, Edward Teller. Yeah. He comes from the atomic yeah. bomb. He had the idea to control the weather by atomic bomb. He proposed the shield. Hmm for sun radiation management. So the same person, yes. the same power structure is organizing this type of uh, management of the planet yeah. and of the space. Yeah. So um, you know about the intention control. What well, we some, for control some water, people, we for some people the intention is really one of making others suffer. And therefore things of in aspects of geoengineering are about links with military warfare, mm -hmm. you know. How do you alter the climate so that you can just make rain fall, fall, fail in a particular area and let agriculture suffer? But in other cases, even there is, if there isn't that military intention of harm to the other, there is a ignorance. There is also economic interest. And Not all. The reason that there's such a battalion of scientists behind it. You know, oil and not soil. I, was yeah, your, but that no, was first. See, the point now is, we have food the people, and water. the people food who are pushing it have a money interest. Yeah. The people who are pushing it have a military interest. Mm -hmm. The players merely have the arrogance mm -hmm. that I have a solution, and it's the combination of the stupidity combined with arrogance of the little players mm -hmm. and the evil projects of the ones who control it, that combination is what makes it toxic. Because if the scientific community could only recognize its responsibility to society and the planet and say, I will not be part of your games, which is how Scientists for Social Responsibility was created, which is how the group that um, started to monitor the whole nuclear issue, those were all scientists. Mm -hmm. This is a marriage of stupid scientists mm -hmm. with evil minds. Yeah. And we need 
scientists with responsibility to be the counterforce, to say this is not science, just as we need in genetic engineering. And it's as the community of scientists who really know the science start to speak more and organize better that the stupid science of the, of, of the biotech industry will quieten down. And biotech and geoengineering have the same mindset of engineering, of power, of control, of mastery over nature. Yeah, you, spoke, yeah. Uh, you spoke also yeah. of the dams. Yeah. 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 It's a big yeah. uh, geoengineering also in yeah. India and in the whole world. And there are now the big interest of water. Yeah. And here we have we had uh, to, uh, last time we had um, an interview with uh, Pat Mooney, and he said big the dams, the energy production, the water control, and the weather control. It's one thing. So it's not only a small intervention to 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 have crops. It's something more. No, it's the, the control, ultimate. As I said, it's the ultimate. The atmosphere it is the, the ultimate hubris. Sense. It's the ultimate hubris. That's what it is. Hubris on a planetary scale. Uh -huh. What do you think about um, the fact they will uh, um, spray nanoparticles? That's the, pro the program. Well, each of these issues has a particular aspect that's different. Yeah. Yeah. But I think those particular aspects are very small compared to the overall damage and the overall irresponsibility. For me, the first issue is, how dare you do this? How dare you? That has to be humanity's response. Mm. Then the rest of the little thing of how nanoparticles can harm or how too much sulfur in the atmosphere can harm, those are specific details. Mm -hmm. But this is a civilizational issue. In civilizational issues, you don't look at the tiny details as the debate. You have to look at the big picture.